my name again is Brock Edwards and I'm supervised by Dr. Fei Wong and Dr. Peter Outridge. And um, my, I'm a third year PhD student um, studying mercury emissions from Icelandic volcanism. Um, and uh, basically mercury is the element of my project's focus. It's an environmentally important element that we know of. Um, it's emitted from anthropogenic sources such as coal plants and small scale mining as well as from natural sources like volcanoes. Um, and the methylated and inorganic forms of mercury are highly toxic, bioaccumulative, uh, and persistent ecosystems. And now gaseous elemental mercury, this species of mercury is the, the dominant um, species in the atmosphere. And I'll call it GEM throughout the presentation. So just know that I'm referring to mercury. Um, and it undergoes long range travel and eventual deposition far from the source, whether that be um, a smokestack chimney or a um, kind of a natural volcano chimney uh, emitting mercury and other gases into the atmosphere. So the general context uh, of the mercury flux to the atmosphere picture is um, we have a very good understanding for the most part of the anthropogenic flux as well as the secondary uh, fluxes to the atmosphere. But the volcanic flux, um, well, you know, nominally they say 500 tons based on AMAP data and, and Peter Ridge's work. Um, it's actually, uh, it could be a lot more uh, higher, a lot higher or a lot lower than that. There's um, a lot of uncertainties about this particular uh, sort of line item in the global mercury budget. And that's really due to the diversity of volcanism, um, temporal variability in volcanic fluxes, uh, methodological issues. These I summarize in a, a review paper that I was able to publish with uh, Peter and my and Faye and others uh, last year. And um, the low number of volcanoes and volcanic regions studied for mercury emissions is kind of the the major knowledge gap. Um, there's just hasn't been a whole lot of work at volcanoes looking at mercury emissions, and furthermore, uh, looking at uh, you know going back year after year to see how they vary over time. So um, one of these areas uh, is Iceland, which besides being a beautiful country to visit, is a highly active volcanic island um, in the North Atlantic that coincides with both a spreading ridge system and a mantle plume hotspot, so like Hawaii. So it's kind of like two different um, tectonic settings and Iceland straddles both of them. As such, it is uh, the site of a lot of high temperature geothermal degassing ongoing, you know, um, year after year, uh, but also frequent eruptions, you know, that usually occur once every five years. Um, so if you think about the 2010 eruption that caused all those, you know, flight cancellations in Europe, uh, the Eyjafjallajökull the Yokut eruption, five years later, the Bardabunga eruption occurred. And then as I'll get to in the next slide, there was the most recent eruption, the Fagradalsfjall eruption, which occurred in 2021. So very regular volcanic activity. That being said, um, in terms of mercury, the emissions data from this region haven't been looked at or studied uh, really in, in 30 plus years. So it's a major knowledge gap from such a active volcanic island. Um, and so my project is focusing on uh, understanding the geothermal degassing budget of mercury to the atmosphere. But I was also lucky enough to um, be on the ground for an eruption that occurred last March. Um, and this is the Fagradalsiat Fischer eruption, about 40 kilometers southwest of Reykjavik uh, capital region that began on the 19th of March, 2021. And so briefly, this is a, a summary from a poster I presented at AGU last year. Um, basically, we took our Lumex mercury uh, measuring instrument and then the multi-gas instrument that measures major gases like SO2, uh, CO2, hydrogen sulfide. We do co-sampling um, of the volcanic plume. So we get our ratios between these two gases, which I think based on how wild the weather is in Iceland and how much the plume is just blown around, <clears throat> there's not a great correlation, but we can take the median uh, concentrations over these study periods. Uh, which, you know, the end values are quite high because data acquisition occurs every 10 seconds. And from that, we obtain our ratio of GEM, so that's our mercury, to SO2. Uh, and then we can use that to basically calculate or estimate a flux of mercury from the eruption. 
without having any other methods um, possible for you know imaging the mercury in the air as we do for SO2. And so um, to index the mercury to the SO2, we get the SO2 flux estimates um, by doing these traverses beneath the plume. So it's a spectroscopic technique for measuring uh, based on wind speed and wind direction, how much, mer uh, how much SO2 is fluxing out of the volcano to the atmosphere. And I'll show a picture of that in the next slide. The idea is we had a good sort of idea, uh, you know, a uh, good confidence here, 2,300 to 5,000 tons per day of SO2, and we can index the mercury to that, and so um, 0 0.3 to 0 0.6 tons of mercury is how much was released from this volcano, we estimate, over the six-month eruption. And so with the, the DOAS here, this SO2 measuring instrument, we're basically just walking underneath the plume or driving underneath it on a daily or semi-weekly basis to get our mobile differential optical absorption spectrometry and calculate the flux there. So in this case, we were at the site and we walked beneath the plume, which you can see here. And in the case on the right, we attach it to a car and I actually have the Lumex here measuring mercury as well. And we drive beneath the plume and do that on day after day and, and we get a good idea of the SO2 flux. So the big picture from this study is when we have our calculated mercury flux from Fagradalsviat, it fits in with these other hotspot rift volcano estimates, which are, are quite low compared to the, this other sort of contrasting volcanic system, the subduction zone arc volcanoes shown here on the left. And so there's this difference between these admittedly few estimates. This is, again, why we need more data. But it shows, uh, you know, this difference that we interpret to be due to uh, these processes of basically the much of the mercury is actually in the crust. So at these subduction zone arc volcanoes, you've got the assimilation of this crustal mercury material leading to a higher flux from these types of volcanoes compared to a, you know, a mantle plume sourced hotspot volcano or a rift like Iceland or like Kilauea in Hawaii, which you may be familiar with. And so this is a mercury poor mantle plume melt that isn't assimilating these materials. And so we see lower mercury fluxes from these types of volcanoes. So that's the kind of big picture. And it's really interesting to be able to go to Iceland and get this data within the first few weeks of the eruption. Um, as you can imagine, getting to an active volcano and taking measurements is quite a, it's quite a difficult task, but um, we were able to with colleagues from the University of Iceland and Velistofa, um, the Icelandic Met Office. And just I'll briefly touch on the other Icelandic work I'm doing, and that was when I mentioned earlier the ongoing geothermal mercury emissions. Um, basically, I'm taking measurements at several of these high temperature geothermal sites across Iceland. We're taking soil air mercury flux measurements so that we can understand how much mercury is coming up through the soil and also taking measurements at fumaroles and other venting uh, degassing features. And so with this, you know, mercury flux measurements, we're basically at a degassing geothermal site and taking all these individual measurements of mercury below the surface of the soil, about 10 centimeters, and then at the surface so that we have a gradient. And then I use soil characteristics, soil analyses to um, estimate the mercury flux at that one individual location and then you multiply that by all these sites we get to, uh, 100 in this case almost, and we see that the, temp or the um, concentration gradients can be nothing in some points, just one nanogram, or they can be you know, several thousands of nanograms, just 10 centimeters below the surface. So I'm currently in the process of mapping out the flux, and the idea is to go to you know, several of these sites and get a, um, a larger idea sort of form a picture of the geothermal budget. And that way we have, um, from basaltic fissure eruptions occurring in Iceland, we have an idea how much mercury is emitted from those, and then also from these geothermal sites. The whole sort of project goal is to revise or basically calculate a first estimate of regional volcanic mercury emissions from Iceland and improve our understanding of the volcanic contributions to the atmosphere um, of mercury. So how much uh, from where, you know, our subduction zone systems versus 
uh, hotspot rift zones. And a major sort of finding from that work is because arc volcanoes seem to emit so much more mercury, it's an important thing to uh, look into all these unstudied arc volcanoes in places like South America or Vanuatu, because they may be emitting a lot of mercury, but we just have no idea. And that will change the balance of anthropogenic versus natural mercury emissions. And these discoveries or these findings will help you know, to inform better policies and regulations on curbing anthropogenic mercury emissions. And in the end, just limiting the exposure, uh, the toxic exposure of mercury to humans and wildlife. So that was, uh, that's my project in a nutshell. Um, I'm happy to take any questions for a minute or two, but these are my references and uh, Messi, thank you for listening. Do you need someone to break the ice? Sure, do you? I can. Obviously, it's naive. I'm not a specialist. I was wondering uh, for the uh, underwater um, volcanoes, uh, is there any, uh, anything released in the atmosphere or everything is uh, directly well, remaining in, in water? That's a really, really good question. Um, I think the general idea is that a lot of it stays in the ocean reservoir, but a few studies, uh, two I believe, have noticed um, these high temperature bubbles that just rise to the surface full of mercury and other gases as well. And so they, they breach at the surface and then they release to the atmosphere. So it seems like there's at least two different kinds of processes going on with the, the fate of mercury emitted from undersea volcanism. Okay, very I, was, I was thinking of the Tongas volcano uh, from, from two weeks ago, which started underwater, continued above the water and finished under the water. So I was, mm -hmm. I was wondering about that. Thanks. Great presentation. Merci. Christine? Thank you. Uh, great presentation. My um, question is somewhat related to Gilles. Um, I was wondering what's the extent of the plume? And I don't know, do, 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 can you um, draw it from based on the, the, the measurements that you have or that you are collecting or have collected? And uh, do concentrations uh, decrease very rapidly from the volcano? Uh, yeah, so our colleagues in Iceland are, um, they use other instruments that I'm currently getting the data for, and that's these scanning DOAS instruments that image the plume, you know, from a really wide angle, and they can see how the dilution changes. And I'm hoping that when we have that data, that will help to understand the fate of mercury as well. Um, because we did say, take a few measurements from further away, 40, 50 kilometers, but the mercury levels were quite low even as we were seeing some SO2. So uh, there haven't been a lot of studies on that, but it may be that they, they sort of diverge in their characteristics in the air, in the plume. So, uh, yeah. Thanks. Let me, Let me do one more question uh, from Michael. Sure, thanks for the presentation, Brock. Very interesting study for sure. I'm reasonably familiar with mercury and definitely some of the data gaps on uh, volcanic emissions. Um, is the overall intent to eventually try and figure out, are there similar patterns in those mercury sulfur dioxide ratios that you could take that and use it at other sites where there's only SO2 measurements to try and actually calculate some sort of estimate, for example, from an arc volcano or or elsewhere where you have reliable SO2 measurements, but no mercury information? Yes, uh, that's the holy grail really of what we're doing is uh, try to constrain the mercury SO2 ratios at different systems so that we can scale up. And this has been done, but um, based on the way that the data has been treated, it leads to a, a wide range of estimates for a global mercury flux. So I think, um, yeah, focusing on the mercury SO2 ratio is um, is important in different systems so that's why i think the work that we've done here is quite valuable because so much of the data is from arc systems mm. less so from uh, hotspot rift systems so it's nice to be able to add a piece to the puzzle here but this ratio fits in pretty closely with other you know kilauea near Rigongo, these other rift systems as well so it shows a pattern that they're all quite low, you know, 10 to the negative six or 10 to the negative seven is the ratio. Um, but further work, yeah, we need to constrain that. 
and also look into potentially other gases such as CO2, which in some systems may be a better sort of index gas to track how much mercury is being emitted. So, yeah. Great project. Thank you.